Welcome to my talk on KFAPE, a model-based testing approach for verifying programs against their TLA plus specifications. I'm a senior SDE working for Microsoft Azure WAN. My interests are scheduler algorithms, graph algorithms, distributed systems design in general, and obviously formal methods. My motivation was that I had a complex distributed system to implement. There was a central tree-like database and a collection of recipes, sort of like Apache Curator, that would be used as sort of client protocols to establish different distributed systems uh, primitives uh, through communicating over this database. I specified the protocols in TLA+, which allowed me to check their liveness and safety, but tricky order-sensitive bugs still occur to my implementation. So the question was, how do I check my program against the spec? The spec is much higher level, and I have this implementing program, and I need to find a way to bridge those two. Let's talk about testing strategies. There are trade-offs between testing methods, from the level of practicality and closeness to the implementation to the formal level of compliance with the specification. At the bottom, we have traditional unit tests. Slightly above this is the trace checking concept introduced by Ron Pressler to verify the execution traces of a program against a model. Above this, I consider there to be model-based testing where we use some formal methods to generate a number of test cases or scenarios to drive a program through. And at the top, you have a formal implementation as a refinement of a formal specification. For instance, the work in SEL4, the operating system, um, Daphne or Spark Ada, which are checked languages. KFAPE is an attempt to test implementing programs against their TLA plus specifications. It supports trace checking, but it also supports model-based testing which is stepping the program through the TLC model. It currently supports C Sharp as a target language, though other bindings are possible. This presentation mostly focuses on the model-based testing components, since trace checking is already described in Pressler's paper. Now, trace checking is a simple and ingenious idea due to Ron Pressler, um, which is to capture traces from the program execution and use those to see if the execution traces are a valid behavior in the model. So the first step is to convert the traces into a TLA plus sequence and include that in a constant in the model with a line number as the variable. And the idea is that that next action will enable the action that corresponds to each line in that sequence in turn as a refinement of the model. Then you can use TLC to check that the resulting behavior doesn't violate any invariance, but also doesn't deadlock. Because if the traces go off the rails, then that would cause the model to deadlock because there would be no, that action, that sequence would not correspond to any action. Now let's evaluate the use of trace checker. The obvious pro is that this is very easy to use and even homebrew. You just need some way of getting your execution traces out of your program and into TLA plus sequence form. And you can do this right for the TLA toolbox. Um, it's easily adapted to legacy code. In fact, you can use this to document code you don't understand um, as a specification, and then you, by running those execution traces, you can test your assumptions about your understanding of that code, which is really, really beneficial. It also makes sure that your spec doesn't go stale, because if you're running these from execution traces that you're harvesting from production, then you'll get flagged, your spec will get flagged if anything goes off the rails. And it's also useful for root cause analysis, because the specification will give you a high level trace back. It'll point to exactly the line number where things diverge from what the model says is possible. The cons is that this is not really a testing method. It's only retrospective. You need some way of generating these things. You can have a stress test or something like that, but there's no real guarantees. You're not exploring any edge cases. And there's a couple of feasibility issues. For one, you need an unbroken sequence of traces from the start, or you need some way of checkpointing your entire state. and especially if you have things like unique IDs, accomplishing that from production traces can be really non-trivial. Now we get to the idea I had with KFAPE, to do model-based testing using TLC to guide a harness through altering the program under test with actions. At the top, we have a TLC behavior. This is a path in the TLC state graph from the initial state, which we assume there's just one state, through a series of different steps. At the, with the harness takes the program under test and describes its current state as a TLA plus expression. Here we can see that the current program state matches step zero. 
At each step, the program under test is asked for the actions that it can perform. We see that only one of those actions matches the behavior, so that's the action that we pick. Then we perform that action on the program and then move on to the next step. We repeat this and make sure that every step that the action that we performed actually matches what we expected and that no inappropriate actions are enabled. An inappropriate action would be if the program enables an action that is not does not have a path to it in the TLC state graph. So the assumption we make with the model player is that all that we can do is reset the program, capture its state, and match actions to future states. So how we accomplish this is by running TLC and capturing the full state graph. This comes as a graph biz file at the moment. Then we calculate a minimal spanning set of sequences of behaviors that visit every state or transition at least once. So we get a set of these behaviors so that every state in the TLC state graph is covered. Then we devise a harness that just checks the program state against the current TLC model state, selects the program action that promises a state matching the next step, and then execute it. There are a number of pros of this approach. For one, it's a test method. It's an actual formal test method, and we don't have to run simulated load through it like the trace checker. The other thing is that it's a deterministic test of highly concurrent code, and uh, it's exhaustive with respect to the model. The idea is that the, we're covering every single state or every transition, depending on how you configure it in the model. And it eliminates having to handcraft all of these different scenario tests because you sort of have all these behaviors that are taking the place of that scenario test. You can discover more bugs simply by cranking up the model size, and it doesn't require rewriting your program in a checked language like Spark or Daphne. The cons are that it may take some refactoring to get the required introspection to do those model bindings. And the harness development at the moment has a bit of a learning curve to it. It's a little bit more cumbersome than a regular unit test harness. It also plays only legal action sequences. So you risk testing only the happy paths. So you can take care of that by making sure that the only actions that are available are the ones that are actually enabled in the TLC state graph. Also, the harness will be very complex if the model doesn't closely resemble the program. And it's also inefficient with large models. Now, there are blind spots to the model player, which aren't exactly cons as much as pitfalls that one can into. One of these is hidden variables. The model player assumes that the TLC state represents the closure of the entire program state, since multiple orders of TLC states aren't tested, which means that in order for it to be truly accurate and check that it implements the model in some sense, you have to make sure that all of your um, variables are sort of reflected in the TLC state. So if, you, if two program states map to the same TLC state, then only one of those will be tested. And it is infeasible to eliminate all hidden variables. So you have to take care to capture the most important ones, the ones that actually reflect the protocol that you're testing. The other issue is random numbers, basically. How do you express a GUID in TLS? There's so many of them. In such a way that TLC can check a model that generates random GUIDs? And how do you bind that between the model and the implementation? I had this issue and I had to have a sort of mapping between GUIDs and numbers, but it was cumbersome and it reduced the test fidelity, which actually let a couple of bugs in. That's how you, you can solve this by creating a correspondence mapping. Of course, this downside also applies to trace checking, applies to trace checking as well, or any model-based testing system. And if anybody has ideas on how to solve this, please uh, contact me. Now we get to the architecture of Kfabe. In the system architecture, there are four user-provided components to these tests. The first, obviously, is the TLA plus spec and the model parameters needed to invoke TLC. The second is the context. This can be whatever you'd like it to be, but it should reflect the all the things that you need to reflect the current state of the system. The second are the actions, the next possible states of the context in the model. You can check actions for enablement and you can run those but to mutate the context. Finally, you have the harness. The harness provides an initialized new fresh context for every reset, also tears down the existing one if that has to happen, and it provides all the possible next actions given the current context. During the run, first TLC is run and it pro produces a state graph of the execution. The state graph is then fed into a route solver, which computes the minimal set of spanning behaviors over the state graph. These behaviors are then fed into the model player, which plays each behavior using the harness. 
The TLA plus parser is responsible for deserializing and serializing program data structures into and out of TLA plus expressions. On the right, you can see the architecture and the data flow. After the route solving, the model player first resets the harness to produce the fresh context. Next, for each step in the behavior, first, it gets the current state of the context in TLA plus serializable form and checks that the actual state matches the expected state. This catches if any of the actions don't produce a future state that they promised. Second step is to get the list of possible next states from the harness and check that only one enabled state matches the next state value. Third, we run that single action which mutates the context, and then we move on to the next step. Once the behavior is finished, the model player resets and it continues with the next behavior. Now I'll discuss the routing algorithm. We have this TLSC state graph, and we need to explore it and hit each state at least once. So let's assume without loss of generality that there's one initial state and that the digraph comes from TLC. The state inspection problem is as follows. Given a digraph and a root node, compute the minimal set of paths from the root node that visits every node at least once, subject to a reset penalty for starting at the root. This reduces the amount of time that we have to spend rerunning previous states. The complexity of this, unfortunately, is NP-hard because it's basically the traveling salesman problem. You can take a fully connected graph where each node is a city in TSP and each edge is a travel cost to that other city. This is, of course, a metric symmetric um, uh, graph. Then you can draw zero cost edges to each node from the root and have an infinite restart penalty. That would solve the traveling salesman problem. Now let's look at graph construction. The first figure is the TLC state graph, pretty much unmodified. We have the root node, which is just the initial state, and there's cost one links to every state that is in the uh, TLC state graph. The first thing that we do to produce figure two is that we restart from any node, so let's draw edges back to the root with the penalty cost. Now, most traveling salesman solvers require graphs to be metric. Basically, they have to satisfy the triangle equality, where if you have a path from A to C, the cost of that path should be less than or equal to the cost of AB plus BC, where B, AB and BC are spur paths to get there. Doing all pairs shortest path on the graph that we had in figure two trivially satisfies this. And in practice, this is best done with simple breadth first search, which takes order uh, vertex times edge time and vertex squared space because we have to produce a full graph. So by con uh, converting our graph to this metric form, we can then use an off-the-shelf traveling salesman solver. Now that we've transformed our graph, let's compute the tour. Running the traveling salesman problem gives us a sequence of nodes to visit in order. To compute the behaviors, we need to figure out the paths to take to make behaviors that correspond to hitting those nodes in that order. So, we just need to revisit each one, in turn, restarting when necessary. Let's start with some variable declarations. Let current and next be the current and next node. Initially, current will be the root. There will be no next node. And path is the current behavior under construction. Spur is the shortest path from current to next on the, first, on the initial TLC state graph, or null if no path exists. We also have the path from root, which always exists trivially because that's how TLC discovered it in the first place. Then. At each, for each one of those nodes that the traveling salesman solver gave us an order, we just calculate that the next path should be the current path plus the spur path, the one from current to next, if the cost of that spur is um, uh, less than or equal to the cost from root. Otherwise, simply append path to the behavior set and start over from the path from root, which we also do if, there's, if it's infeasible to get from current to next. For transition inspection, we have a slightly different problem. We want to visit each transition rather than each node, and visiting each transition at least once on a minimal cost path is known as the Chinese postman problem or the route inspection problem. There's a polynomial time algorithm to solve this in order v squared times e as min cost flow, if and only if the graph is strongly connected. Unfortunately, our graphs aren't, so we'd have to augment them somehow. So the solution that we can do here is to identify strongly connected components, which we can do in linear time with Tarjan's algorithm or something similar, then augment the graph so that each strongly connected component has a single edge to root. 
this won't be optimal since in the Chinese postman problem, all edges are mandatory. Uh, having optional edges turns it into an NP-complete problem, unfortunately. But this does make it feasible for CPP at work. Now, the optimal solution is to translate the edges to nodes and use the TSP approach, which is NP-hard, or equivalently, this is known as the rural postman problem. As an example of the Chinese postman approach to the transition inspection problem, let's look at the following example. Here we see three strongly connected components, CC1, CC2, and CC3. We can't visit CC1, 2, and 3 without augments. We can visit CC1 and then CC2, but we have no way of getting back to the root to visit CC3. So we do need at least one augment. However, it's difficult to know what augments we need ahead of time. So the simplest approach is to add one augment per connected component. However, over augmentation causes needless revisits because there's no way of making these optional. Now I'll briefly touch on the implementation of Kfabe. For TLA plus serialization, I built a parser using the pigeon parser combinator. Primitive types such as NAT or bool or string can be serialized automatically. There are several ways to serialize complex types. So I have a default serialization, but you can override this, for instance, alternating between functions and records. Since TLA plus isn't typed, we also want to have some polymorphism, which we accomplish by having something like TLA either, which allows you to have, for instance, a string or a model value. So at the top, we have uh, the C sharp implementation using the TLA serializer, and this corresponds below to the TLA this TLA plus expression. For the traveling salesman solver, I used Google's OR tools since it has bindings to many languages, including C sharp. It doesn't have an approximation solver for asymmetric TSPs, so we just use heuristics, starting with the greedy path cheapest arc strategy for the first solution, and then using guided local search to try to refine it to be a better solution. Since there are no guarantees, we have to set a time limit on the solver, and we get better results the longer we let it run. TSP, for this reason, isn't actually the bottleneck, since any solution order is valid. It's just that if we get a bad ordering, it might take us a lot longer to run our test. There are approximation solvers that provide good guarantees, like Christophides' algorithm, which gives you three halves of optimal. Unfortunately, those only work for symmetric TSPs, and it's somewhat complicated to transform an asymmetric TSP into a symmetric TSP, or to find an approximation solver that actually works natively with asymmetric. I'll now talk about the user experience of using Kfabe. There are five steps to building a Kfabe model harness. First, we have to define the data contracts, the data structures that correspond to our TLA plus uh, state that goes into TLC. Second, we define the execution context, which is really just whatever we need it to be. And then we define a state mapping function which will map between program state and these TLA plus states, allowing us to summarize the program state at every step. Then we implement the harness, which has certain contracts, and then we implement those actions that are um, proposed by the harness at each step, and which Kfabe uses to select the one that matches the next step in the TLC behavior. For example, I'll use map collection, which is one of the distributed systems recipes that I had to check with Kfabe. It's a simple daemon that watches a source collection, and it activates target commands when each of those collection items changes or gets added or the responses that correspond to handling that expire. In this test, the commands simply update a target collection to reflect the source collection, creating a sort of mirror. And the only temporal property that I really check with TLC is eventual consistency. First, we have the data contracts. So we have the state, which consists of the source collection, all of those commands and the mirror, which is of the, the same type as the source collection, but it's the target collection. Each one of those you can see from here boils down to other complex types until we have all of the TLA members that we need. Second, we have the execution context, which I use mostly just to include a series of hooks to allow introspection into my program. Fortunately for me, I used a database, so this was very easy to do. I just had to read the database and summarize it. The context is completely up to you. You get a fresh one whenever you reset, so that would be equivalent to sort of restarting your program. And the context is passed through the system whenever it's time to get new actions or to take an action that has been selected by Kfabe and execute it when triggered. Third, we have the state mapping function. This will return a TLA plus serializable state when called at any step in the program. 
This is what requires inspection into the program state. Fourth, we have the harness, which is at the core of what the user has to provide to use Kfabe. First, the harness has to supply the TLC config, including the constants and TLA plus serializable syntax, any model values or other parameters, and of course, the specification to execute. The harness then provides the context lifecycle methods. You have reset to restart the, the program and get a fresh context, describe current state, which is what returns that TLC state, and get next actions, which is a bit like the specs next axiom, but enablement checks are optional. Next, you have the actions. For simplicity, actions only need to modify the current state to produce the next state. The constructor will simply mutate the current state in that action to match the successor state that it promises. So for instance, here we have, uh, we're just updating the collection item and source, and it will, since it has a copy of the current state, that's all it needs to do. The model player will then select the single action that matches that state to the next state in the behavior and then calls run. It's the responsibility of run to make sure that the program state matches that promised state. Finally, it's time to run the test. First, we just have to instantiate the harness. Then we call prepare, which will run TLC and the route solver to come up with that series of behaviors. Then we call run, and that executes the model player and runs it over the behaviors. Debugging is actually quite simple because you can break on the step that fails and you have the full TLC trace to guide you. I'll end by discussing future work, extensions, and alternatives that Kfabe could use. First, I'll talk about alternatives to the routing algorithm. The routing algorithm, as it stands, is only tractable for problems with fewer than, say, about 10,000 states. After that, it just scales too badly because it's, it scales as order v squared. So exhaustive state-space search on large models is infeasible. However, we can run TLC as a coroutine with a program under test and piggyback on that, that TLC state exploration to guide the model. We have to be a little bit um, clever with how we do this because uh, TLC will fan out to a very large degree and we can't keep that many program states in memory, but there might be some tricks we can play there. The second is that we can use an approximation solver with a fixed runtime rather than OR tools, which for our asymmetric TSPs doesn't really give us any guarantees. So asymmetric TSP approximation solvers are a hot area of research. The simplest approach is probably to find a way of converting our problem to a symmetric TSP and then use Christophides algorithm, which does give us like V squared log V time and a, an actual guarantee of optimality. The third is to implement the Chinese Postman and strongly connected components spur strategy for transition inspection, because in a lot of cases, we have hidden variables and it actually makes sense to visit transitions rather than individual states. That concludes the presentation. Thanks for watching. I'm currently working on open sourcing Kfabe. As soon as I do, I'll let people know. Um, collaboration is welcome. Please feel free to contact me if you're interested in this approach to testing or if you want to know when the code is released.